Yay, here we are, live again in person from Bulletin Spiritual Sunday. Woo. Yes. Welcome to all of you who are coming online. Well, we're waiting, you guys who are here physically, maybe close your eyes for a moment and just feel the energy or see if you can see the, uh, the angels. Just feel the angels that are here, created through these last three week process. Yes. Shalom. We should have shalom, peace. You know what the word shalom means? Well, we say hello, goodbye, and peace. Always paradox, always, you know, fascinating. How could it be hello and goodbye? Those are opposite things. And peace, okay, peace is nice. But, you know, once you start learning Kabbalah, what is shalom rooted in? It's rooted in the word shlemut, completeness. So if you think of it that way, what's peace when a person's complete? If we're completely uh, satiated, then you're at peace. When a person feels a lack, it doesn't mean we don't have a lack, but if a person's not feeling complete with what they are and what they've got now, then they cannot grow from there. But once you feel complete where you're at, like they say, who's a wise man? Oh, excuse me. Who's a wise person? The one who's happy with his lot, what he's got now. Doesn't mean he can't have more. Doesn't mean settled with. It just means happy. I know exactly where I am now, and everything going on is exactly what I need for my correction, for my ability to completely reveal all the light of my soul, to complete the mission that I came here for, and to inspire and guide others to do the same. That's completeness. That's shalom. There's no peace. Nobody can have peace, true peace, if the world's not at peace. Because as we often talk about, and somewhere along the line will probably show up today also, there's only one of us in the world, right? We go back to Genesis 1. There was only one being created. Then we got extended into 8 billion bodies, but there's still only one soul and technically one being. So how can a person be complete if they're not connected to all the parts of their own soul? Can't be. Can't be. But that's what the opponent has made people think about is, well, no, if I can get rid of all the people who from my point of view, have caused uh, unrest in my mind, then I'll be at peace. But that's not true. That's like, you know, people trying to get rid of parts of their body that hurt so that they'll be at peace. Meanwhile, they're getting rid of parts of their body. So how can they be complete? Cannot be. Our job is to transform, transform everything from darkness to light and chaos to order. Why? Or how's that? And then we'll go into our, our uh, affirmation, the fundamental thing that most people don't keep in mind is that there's absolute perfection already existing in the world. Already absolute perfection. If you think about a thousand years ago, where was the cell phone? Where was the cell phone a thousand years ago? It was in potential. It was, it was in the cosmos in potential. Science had just not uncovered enough of the laws of the universe to be able to put the cell phone together. There's nothing new, nothing that makes a cell phone today, not the physical material, nor the laws of science that didn't exist since the Big Bang, 14 and a half billion years ago. So in the same way, when we're thinking of peace on earth and all of that, it already exists. It's just our job to uncover it. That's what free will means. Free will means we have the ability of covering it up or revealing it. So what the center is teaching us is how to uncover our perfection. But you can't uncover yours if you're not uncovering others. That's why love your neighbor as yourself. It doesn't say love yourself and then you can love your neighbor. Or love your neighbor and then you can love yourself. It's love your neighbor as yourself, meaning at the same time. You want to have all your blessings? You've got to shine your, the light of your blessings out to everybody else on earth. So everybody wins. All right, so let's do our affirmation. We want to grow our consciousness, and so we need to keep remembering and remind ourselves of the truth. So we say it together. Consciousness is everything. I raise my consciousness today to see the miracles and wonders of life. I commit myself to behave with greater love, compassion, and kindness towards all human beings. And it's getting tougher and tougher because the Zohar told us 2,000 years ago 
that in the days we we're in, close to the end of chaos, or it technically could be any day, the removal of all the chaos and transforming it into peace on earth, you're going to see extreme darkness and extreme light. And that's where we're going. So our job is just to read the signs. And we've had them for thousands of years. That's all that Kabbalah is giving us, is the signs to see, you know, like road signs, what's coming up. So if you see a sign, if you're driving somewhere and you see a sign says, you know, whatever, um, what do they call it now? Um, road work in half a mile, streets blocked. Who's the person who just ignores the sign and just keeps going on the road? Very intelligent person, right? Figured they knew better than the signs. Maybe thought the sign was a fake. Maybe thought somebody else brought it there. And then when they run into the roadblock and they have to go back again and again, then what? You think they're taking responsibility? No, most likely they're blaming somebody else. All right, because that's human nature, and our job is to be divine. Okay, so let's get into today, or I'm going to go, Shh. yeah, my Libra's going to kick in, and I'm going to go everywhere. So, you know, there's IQ. When I grew up, there was IQ. You had IQ tests. Then in the last, whatever it is, 20 years or so, suddenly there's emotional intelligence, right? If you're emotionally intelligent, then you're really intelligent. You'll have success in life, blah, 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 all of that. Except you and I have come to understand the essence of emotions are also ups and downs. Everybody agreeing with you, your emotions are up. People not agreeing with you, emotions down. So you're on a roller coaster. Who wants to be like that in life? Right? We don't want health, sickness, health, sickness, health, sickness. Happy, sad, happy, angry, happy, fearful. Do you want that? No? Money, no money. Protection, no protection. You don't like that. So a roller coaster amusement park may be one thing, but in life we don't want that kind of roller coaster. So we're learning here, let's call it spiritual intelligence, which I want to put in a frame that it's illogical. And so, you know, as the fr saying used to go, Kabbalah will drive you crazy. Right? Some of you may have heard that from family or friends or whatever, trying to protect you from learning Kabbalah. No, you can't learn Kabbalah. They say, if you learn too much Kabbalah, you'll go crazy. Okay, so let's see. Let's see. So let's talk about logic. Right? We'll all become Mr. Spock for a moment. Right? Logical, unemotional, just objective. Yes? So logic, what, this essence of logic is what? To sort of see congruence in things. So there is an aspect we say, okay, somebody acts badly, one day you have this friend, uh, not you, there's a person who has a friend for years and years and years, and then all of a sudden they're acting horribly, horribly, horribly. What's logic say? Run away from them. Disconnect from them. Right? They're behaving badly. Somebody's work. The boss asks them to do something that's a little, um, let's call it not so kosher. Goes against your belief. So what do you do? You quit the job. I mean, there's a logic to that. You don't put on a blindfold and try and run across a busy street. Logic. Logic. But let's look at another side of that kind of logic. What, what we'll call stupid logic. If that's okay with you. Because my kids aren't listening and I used to tell them you don't use the word stupid. <laughs> so they'd say, Abba, so-and-so is stu and pid. So they didn't say, <laughs> anyway, stupid logic. Person gets angry because somebody else did something nasty or criticizing them or whatever it is. What's their logic? Beat them up. Right? That's logical, but it's stupid logic. Because maybe, like, unfortunately, we've seen the guy picks a fight with somebody who can beat the bejesus out of them. No? Logic. Logic. Right? Again, going back to work. Don't agree with something. The boss is doing something wrong or whatever, they're doing this and this, so just go curse at the boss. There's a logic to that, right, in one frame, but it also could be the end of the person's job. So there's the stupid logic that we still understand as logic, and then there's what we generally perceive as like a smart logic. Like we said, you don't cross the street blindfolded, because that would just be silly. All right, so as we said, Kabbalah will drive you crazy which 
therefore means relative to that, Kabbalah is very illogical. But it's smart illogical. Or if you want to call it that, it's intelligent logic. Spiritual logic. So let's see how it's different. So logic itself, and if you're new to this just, and you don't agree, okay, just keep listening and we can discuss it later. You can ask a Kabbalah teacher, write me on Facebook or what have you. But we all know that inside our head, if you've been learning since Kabbalah 1, we have a voice that tells us to do all the bad stuff. The voice of the bad habit, we might call it, or we generally call it the opponent. The opponent is there to challenge our commitment to the light, to try and distract us from our mission that we came into this world, which was simply to what? Have peace, have complete bliss. Any of you against having eternal bliss? Any of you online? You can write it real quick on the chat here. Anyone against eternal bliss? No, we all want eternal bliss. That's all we came here to do, but with our free will, which means what? We have to use the power the Creator gave us to reveal light in this world, to reveal the potential of our soul, exercise free will in the proper way. Exercise free will in the proper way. So that opponent uses the logic of this world against us to seek instant gratification, short-term fulfillment, to do things like we said, that seem logical in the moment, but in the long run are foolish. End up in some kind of difficulty, some kind of harm, something that's not beneficial to ourselves. And then there's the spiritual logic. The spiritual logic is based on the 99% realm, which is the spiritual metaphysical realm, that has already absolute perfection. You ever seen a paint by numbers? Try and stay away from the jigsaw puzzle. Use that a lot. You ever seen a paint by numbers? What did they show you on the box? What it's supposed to look like. But when you take it out of the box, what does it look like? It doesn't look like that. It's a blank canvas with a lot of lines on it. And our job is to do what? Complain, take it back to the store. How come? I'm looking for the picture that's on the box. No, the whole point of it is I'm going to create the picture by copying what's on the, the cover and following the numbers. So where it says box one, I use paint one. Where it's number two, I use paint two, etc. till I have that perfect picture again. So Kabbalah is just giving us the 99% is where that perfection exists, that it's our job to copy. And that's why some of the fundamental, some of the fundamental things ooh, in Kabbalah, from Kabbalah one is like this. One and most important, most fundamental. How big is the light of the Creator? Infinite. And what exists in the infinite light of the Creator? It's the only source of lasting fulfillment. The only source. And all you have to do is check in your own life. Did you ever get something that was really great and wonderful for a moment and then kind of faded away? Exactly. Yes, you're the third one. No, you're, you're whatever, you're so excited about this great event you're going to, so you go out and you buy expensive clothes and you feel real good and you're going to walk in like a million bucks. And then after the party's over, hopefully at least that far, sometimes it's in the middle of the party, the fulfillment of that expensive outfit goes away. But usually at the end of the party, the next day or so, you go, what did I do that for? Right? Okay, it was nice, but I could have worn my suit and had the same, same joy and happiness. Right? So the, the, the fulfillment doesn't last. The light is the only source of lasting fulfillment. Only. Not just in the upper worlds. In this world also. Because if there's an infinite light, where does it not exist? It exists in our trouble. It exists in our problem. It exists in our confusion. Wherever we perceive darkness is not because there's no light. It's because spiritually we've covered our eyes. Or like the old saying goes, if a person thinks God is far away, the question really is, who moved? Because the Creator, if it's infinite, can't move anywhere. It exists everywhere infinitely. So it's only we who can, in essence, move away from the light. Like in this room, it's lit up, you put a, a blindfold on, or you put a cover over your head, what happens to the light? Does the light really go off? No, but the person doesn't perceive the light. 
So you and I are learning here in the center not only how to understand the system of the light, but how to uncover our eyes so that we can actually see and experience and live the light in such a way that we will achieve our mission of infinite eternal bliss. For me, that's the big irony. You know, but that voice with a lot of years of, of indoctrination, that opponent in our head has made us believe that the physical material world is our source of fulfillment. And the sad part, I guess, really, what happens over and over and over again? I mean, most of you here have already taken Kabbalah 1, so you understand the idea. Why do people have repetitive challenges in their life? Same thing over and over again. Because they didn't change. We know fundamental law of the universe, and even science agrees. Cause and effect. Action, reaction. So if the same thing's happening to a person over and over and over and over and over again, who is the cause of it? Who is the center and the only common factor in all those situations is the person themselves. So you and I are learning, wake up and look at ourselves, examine ourselves. What are we doing that keeps attracting the same thing? What the opponent does and what the world seems to do is just put it in a different disguise. Person has a job. They don't like the job after a while and then they analyze it. It's because of the, the boss, because of whatever the workers, because of the economy. Got all the right uh, awareness of why physically the job not going well. So then they change jobs. Meaning there's a new disguise. It's still a job. It's still where they're putting in their effort to get some revenue, right? A paycheck. Still, in essence, the same thing. So at first it looks great, and then after a little while it turns out to be the same thing. But in their mind, the opponent makes them believe it's something different. Why? Because there's a different job, different place, different maybe even profession. So just because you change the outside doesn't mean anything on the inside changing. Of course, none of us have ever had somebody in our life that uh, looked at, oh, how are you doing today? Oh, really good, thank you. I'm really good and I like you. But you could already see past their smile that something not right going inside. They're either not so happy or they really don't like you. Right? But they're pretending on outside. Oh, yeah, you're so good, so nice, so kind. So we're learning to see past the outside. So we have to just expand that to be able to see past the outside of everything. And the more intense it is, the more difficult it gets to be. Look at what's going on these last few years. Hard to see good in that, isn't there? Hard to see perfection in that. But we've got to remember, because we're students in the Kabbalah Center, perfection already exists. It's just up to me to reveal it. And so, okay, so let me give you uh, a few examples. This is how, you know, the Kabbalists have been telling us all this stuff for thousands of years, but thousands of years ago, nobody believed it. I mean, who would have accepted uh, microscopic particles thousands of years ago? Nobody. Can't see it? Not real. But like the Rav would always say, you know, the Rav would say, people say, Seeing is believing, right? Once you see it, you believe it. The Rav said, no, the Kabbalists say the opposite. Believing is seeing. So if a person believes all bosses are terrible, guess what they're going to see in their life? Terrible bosses. If they believe whatever, all X, Y, Z is no good, then they're going to keep seeing it over and over because that's what they believe. And what they believe, what we believe, is what will manifest. What we hold long enough. Isn't that the whole idea of what they currently call the law of attraction, like it's a brand new thing. There was no law of attraction 40 years ago. It's only in the last 20 years or so, right? You close your eyes and you meditate on that house and poof, out of nowhere, the house shows up, right? Or the money or the ring or the something. Why? Because we say, if you hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it, you believe, 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 you make it form. Why? Because we've been given the power of the creator so we can create what we want. But if a person believes in that the physical material world is their source of happiness, then that's what they're going to create. Five minutes, they'll be happy with the expensive outfit. Ten minutes, they'll be happy with the person in their life until they see the reality of the person. You know, they'll like the house, they'll like whatever it is until it falls apart. So we don't want to go there. So, and we all know, all in, at least science is also validating. What happens to a person who holds negative emotions inside them? Good stuff? 
No, they weaken their immune system and they get physically sick. It's a common understanding today. 2,000 years ago it wasn't, unless you learned Kabbalah, but today everyone knows. A person holds on to negative emotions, they're weakening their immune system, and of course they're going to get sick some way or another. So here's how the opponent in the illusion works. So let's say life, the physical stupid logic, person has fear, so when a challenge shows up, they're going to run away from the challenge. Why? Because the challenge is causing them some kind of fear, awakening some fear in them. So they run away. But you and I understand that if we are the law of attraction, then like it says, simple. In the book of Job, I believe it is, the thing I feared the most came upon me. So if a person tries to run away from challenges out of fear, wherever they go, they are a magnet for fearful things. So it's going to keep showing up again. It may be different. There may be fear of like an accident. There may be fear of an illness. There may be fear of bad relationships or fear of losing their money. But fear is fear. Does it matter what the focus of the fear is? No. Because the emotion of fear is what will cause a, a weakening of the light force protection shield on the spiritual level and the physical immune system in the physical level. So... Sounds logical, but in the big picture, stupid logic. What will the Kabbalists say? You learn from Kabbalah 1. That's why I keep reminding you, if you haven't had Kabbalah 1 in a while, take it again. It is a foundational understanding upon which everything else in life is based. So we learn in Kabbalah 1, embrace your challenges. Why? Because challenges are a mes are message from our own soul where we're not letting our light shine, where we've put on those spiritual blindfolds and the light cannot radiate. Your eyes work, cover your eyes, you don't see. Not because the eyes stop working, because you block them. So a challenge is just where we blocked our spiritual eyes from looking in our own mirror. So like we said, so the person has fear. So when a challenge comes and pushes the button of fear, what we learn is, Stop for a moment before you react and ask, what are you feeling? And once a person identifies fear, then they know that's what they have to do the opposite of. They have to counteract the fear with some action of fearlessness. And that doesn't mean stupidity, jump off you know, a cliff somewhere because they're scared of heights. That's the stupid logic, right? But facing it means embracing the challenge in some way acting like the light, letting the light emanate. Kindness, like we, like we uh, affirm, greater love, kindness, and compassion. Greater trust in the light of the Creator. Then, once you start to remove the blindfolds, your light can shine out more and more. And like attracts like. More light shining out, more blessings coming back to you. It's not a difficult concept. Or, what about a person holds in life because they've been told, they've accepted, they've seen a few examples, they think, low self-value. Present company accepted, right? So they have that low self-value, so when they look around the world, what's going to be the easiest way to make themselves feel a little better? Look at somebody who's better than them, or has something more than them, or doing more than them, or whatever, again, in their perception, and just tear them down. Right? Rather than raise themselves up to a higher level, if they feel someone's a little higher and they have a low self-value, easier just to try and pull that person down below them, now in relative terms they're ahead of them. But did they move anywhere? No! So they're still going to have the same trouble, the same lack, the same kind of chaotic challenges over and over again, because they didn't change. And everything is based on us. But there's a logic, pull them down. And uh, maybe they did do stupid things, these other people. Maybe they're not good in all parts of their life. But that, so what? If the person stays the same, pulling the other one up or seeing them lower, whatever, doesn't change. It's our transformation that counts. And the beauty is, the Creator gave us 100%. Our job is just to reveal it. We don't have to become, we don't have to make ourselves perfect. We just have to reveal the perfection that's there. Simple question. When do you see, how do you see, 
the perfection of a seed. Think simple. Now, you see a seed, you look at a seed, you don't see perfection, really. So, when do we ultimately see perfection of that seed? When you see the plant or the tree with the fruit, it's on, once you see it's manifest, you oh, the seed must have been perfect. So, the stupid logic says, well, look at the world, it's in chaos. People fighting, hate, disease, all that stuff. So then the seed must be bad. No, that's the stupid logic of the five senses. And how many times do we have to talk about how do magicians make their living? In simple terms. Fooling our five senses. So on the one hand, we want to say, I see the chaos in the world. I see people behaving badly. I see all of this stuff. Then they go to the magic show and they say, I saw a magician create a lion out of thin air in an empty cage in the middle hanging up in the sky. Do you really believe that? No, you and I understand they were fooling our senses somehow. But when it comes to other things, the opponent says, oh no, now your five senses are real. You did see. And I'm not saying people don't misbehave. But you and I are learning to see with the eyes, as the Zohar calls it, the eyes of our heart. Look at the soul of that person. The nastiest behaving person you ever knew, know of, or heard of, still is a piece of the Creator inside them. Unfortunately, they've been listening to that negative voice, our opponent, that we put there, so much they've trained themselves to create, with the power of the Creator in them, chaos. Any of you live alone? In other words, you're like the only one in the house? Don't be scared, okay. No big deal, right? It's not a bad sound. Oh my, do you know who lives by themselves? Oh my God. So you live by yourself. So when, that, when the house is a mess, do you go to the neighbor and say, hey, why'd you come over to my house and make a mess for? Why'd you throw the laundry on the floor? Why does the kitchen have dirty dishes? Do you do that? No, because you know you did it. It's not always comfortable and easy, and sometimes maybe you threw the dishes in the sink and you went out, had a party. Okay, in jest, had a couple drinks, so when you come back, you suddenly see the dish, you go, oh my God, who did that? Because you forgot. You forgot. But we know, we create everything. So the same way, we've been given the power of the Creator, and we decide, create chaos or create order. It's all in our hands. So let me, oh, woof. So, person has a lack or poverty consciousness. And that doesn't mean they have no money. There are plenty. Of, what's a miser? Right? Just in simple definition, a miser. Somebody with no money, right, that doesn't spend any, right? Isn't that a miser? No. Somebody who has a lot of money who's not spending it. Why? Because they don't feel they have enough. But they got a lot of money. So it's the poverty consciousness, lack consciousness, is not only about money, having it or not, it's the sense of lack. Not feeling the power of the Creator inside, the fullness of the Creator. That's where it starts. So, lack poverty consciousness, so don't give. The law of the universe, and go on Kabbalah.com, look up the classes, talk to your teacher, tithing. Every religion on earth talks about it, giving 10% of whatever comes to your hand. So you make $50,000, but after they take taxes, blah, 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 you get a check of whatever it is, $40,000, you give 10% of that, $4,000. You must give it away, spiritually. Don't have to give more than that, but that 10% doesn't belong to us. It's as if the universe slipped in that $4,000 to test us and see, are we going to give it away or are we going to feel, no, no, don't have enough. Don't have enough, so I have to keep it. No, that's the logic, isn't it? There was a woman, okay, let's not go, that's going to take too long. But that's the logic. If I don't think I have, or a person doesn't think they have, and the bills are coming, so they better not give away some money. No, but what does Kabbalah teach us? How do you grow the tree? Remember the seed? So a person has a seed in their hand, they go, oh my God, they only have one seed. So they better not give it to the earth, because then they won't have the seed. But they're waiting while they're holding the seed, for the oranges to fall out of the sky 
so that then they can open the orange, take the seeds out, and then plant the seeds, because then they'll have more. So people with a lack consciousness, whether it's money, forgiveness, kindness, whatever it may be, no, they feel they have a lack of it, so they're going to hold on and wait till more comes their way, and then they'll be willing to give. So sometimes it's not even that they're not willing to give. They're willing to give, they just don't feel they have enough. So you hold the seed, hold the seed, hold the seed. When will the oranges come? Never. Because you have to plant the seed. You have to give it into the earth to let the earth do its magic to make the tree, make the fruit show up. And now you got whatever, three dozen oranges on the tree. So now you planted one seed, you got three dozen new seeds. 36, right? That's it. It's that way. That's what Kabbalah teaches. You plant. You're investing. What's the difference between giving away and investing? In simple, simple 1% terms. Giving away is giving away. That's it, period. It's gone. Investing, at least the concept is, invest into something that's going to make it grow. Like you invest the one seed into Mother Nature of the Earth, investing that it's going to grow. Giving it away is, okay, stand on the top of the building, just throw the seed off there, that's it, no more. It's gone. That's a difference. Tithing charity is investing. If you have the consciousness and you know what to do, it's investing it so it'll grow. That's what Kabbalah is teaching us. That's why every religion says it, they just don't understand maybe all the spiritual details. Okay, one last thing. I mean, we can keep going on and on and on. person has a victim consciousness. You, any, you know anybody like that? All they can talk about, like, we usually call them drama kings and queens. Right? Oh, they did this, and they did this to me, and you don't know, and it would be, blah, blah, blah. So a person has a victim consciousness, like attracts like. Law of cause and effect, similarity of form. So if a person has a victim consciousness, what are they going to attract? Some form of victimizer. Because like will attract like. So now in the victim consciousness, everybody else around them is the bad guy. Everybody else is the opponent. Years ago, I don't know if they still, maybe they have a new phrase for it. If you know a new phrase, so let me know, because I do want to update myself from the 20th century. I'm almost there uh, technologically. I'm a little, maybe in 2005, right? Six, maybe. I'm a little technological in the 21st century. But you ever heard, you know, the phrase, it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world out there, right? And it's a rat race. And you've got to climb the corporate ladder on the bodies of everybody else. Okay, so victim consciousness. Oh, look what happened, blah, 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 blah. That's it. Victim consciousness, so everybody else is the opponent. You just got to beat them up. Lie, cheat, steal, just to stay ahead of them. And I'm not saying physically, but you get the idea. Okay, but again, like will attract like. Person stays a victim, they'll keep ex finding experiences to be victimized by. You can run out in the middle of the desert. So somebody isolates themselves on the top of the mountain with nobody around or in the middle of the desert somewhere, out in the boonies, all by themselves, them in their little cabin. Can't be victimized? Bad weather, flash flood, fires, they could be victimized by nature also. Like will attract like. So how do you stop being a victim? Realize there's only one victimizer. Or as we've often said, there's only one enemy of all humanity. One, the only victimizer that a person has is that voice opponent that we planted inside our heads. The parasites that's saying you've got to exert your spiritual muscle to share greater love, kindness, compassion, generosity, forgiveness, tolerance than you did yesterday. That's all the opponent's there for, just to make us exert our spiritual muscle of sharing, that which the Creator gave us. That's the spiritual logic. You want to stop being victimized by life? Then start beating the only victimizer there is, the opponent in your head. So it says, scream and yell, judge those people, be jealous, envious, whatever it is. No, you do the opposite. Do the opposite. That's how you beat the opponent. The opponent is opposing our sharing, so we beat the opponent by sharing the opposite, the oppositional to the opponent. Not a difficult, difficult concept. So again, what do they say? I had a conversation. Somebody was here over, over, over the weekend. It's still the weekend. Okay, yes, uh, Friday. 
We had an event here, somebody was here, and some friends of theirs from the center had gone to Israel like I had been. And usually when we go to Israel, we go to what's called the energy sites, the graves of the righteous people, because those are energy vortexes that are left for us to access the highest consciousness and awaken our highest consciousness by connecting to those righteous people. So usually when we go, it's usually it's very late, from morning till very late at night. So this particular person who hadn't gone and has never really been, but you know, heard a lot of people talking about, yeah, you start in the morning, you finish at two in the morning, you finish at three in the morning, sometimes, you know, maybe if you're lucky, maybe midnight kind of thing. And he says, boy, isn't that crazy? It sounds insane. And at that moment, it just clicked with me. No, what's insane is not doing it. If you have a chance to energize and awaken the next level of your blessing, the next level of your power to remove your chaos and transform darkness into light, is it insane to do that or is it insane not to do it? person could travel back in time when, I don't want to use the name because I don't know why they'll click here, but when the, one of the original cryptocurrencies, right, when it was 10 cents, if a person could travel back to that, that point and see them for 10 cents or a dollar, would it be insane to buy or insane to not buy? Be insane not to buy. But again, the repetitive pattern. So you go back, anything you want to look at, when certain stock, and again, I don't want to say name, certain things came on the market. People say, oh, no, pfft, that's never going to go. Whoosh! Now you've got computers and cell phones and all these things, right? Okay, another opportunity comes. Whoosh! No, can't happen again, can't happen again. Now you understand. Why do the repetitive patterns come? Because we don't change. We don't see the opportunity. See the opportunity, every challenge, the opportunity reveal light. Don't see it as another challenge. Oh my God, I did such a sharing act yesterday. Why is this happening now? To take you to your next level. We have to think like Kabbalah Center students and hold that and not let the opponent make us look at the physical world. It's not so difficult. So, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. So look at the last four or five years and stand back, pause. Don't get in your emotions over what happened or who, what, when or where. Pause and just look at the big picture as a Kabbalah Center student, as I call it, put on your Kabbalah glasses and now look and see if it's not the same thing, just in a different disguise as has been going on for thousands of years. Unfortunately, I heard people even these last couple days start speaking with not what I would consider Kabbalah Center speech about what's gone on these last few days. I say, really? But look back at history. We even know in Kabbalistic history, it's never them. It's us. But the opponent doesn't want us to believe it's us. Because other people doing nasty things. They're doing dastardly deeds. And I'm not here to deny that people do, including you and I. The thing we forget is what we did. So let's... Have you ever felt criticized, put upon, oppressed by anybody in your life? Yes? So now, if you add up, let's even go with a billion of those pieces of the sense of oppression, right? As I make the metaphor, let's say 10 cents. So you and I have 10 cents of a sense of oppression. But if you add it up a billion times, now in essence you got a hundred million dollars, right? So a hundred million pieces of oppression is going to look like what we've seen over history, not just now. People feeling oppressed, so they're revolution, right? What happened in Cuba? Felt oppressed? Revolution. What happened in America? Felt oppressed? Revolution. It's nothing new. But that opponent, that Satan in our head says, oh no, but look at them now. Don't look at when we did the oppressing. Look at how we're being oppressed. No, it's only the material's the same. It's like I've learned 30, it's coming up on 37 years now. 
I've heard from the Rav and Karen. Hatred is hatred. You can't get rid of darkness with darkness. There's no correct hatred. Go back to any division so both sides hate each other. Do you think one side thinks their hatred is wrong? No, everybody thinks their hatred is logical. Now you know why I call it stupid logic. Pick, I don't care which issue you pick, Democrat, Republican, black, white, yellow, brown, Jew, Christian, Muslim, Buddhist, whatever. Whatever one you pick, which side thinks their hatred is unbased, unfounded? No, their hatred is logical. Right? Because the other person did whatever they did. Again, I'm not denying that part. But did they stop and think as we learn, but wait a second, why is it in my movie? What did I do to attract myself into that situation? I didn't make them do what they did. They were already going to do what they were going to do. Why did, not me, not you, but why did that person have to be there when they were doing what they were going to do? Guy's going to run through a red light. Why was that green car the one that was in the middle of the intersection when the other car ran the red light? It was going to run the red light anyway. Or like the Rav used to say, a thief is walking up and down a, a block deciding which house to, to rob. Why does it pick that house of all the houses on the thing? So again, our stupid logic will say, I don't know, they saw a light, it looked like, you know, nobody was there, on and on and on. But the real truth, like attracts like. Maybe in a past life, that person stole the money and the thief came along to be the channel, take the money back. Doesn't exempt the thief, but from the person who got robbed, you got to say, cause and effect, somehow, somehow. And again, we're not endorsing thievery or anything like that, but we've got to understand, if we don't learn how to take control over our life by this spiritual logic or intelligent, smart illogic, then a person will keep having the same thing over and over again, like 5,000 years of history. It's the same thing. So we've got to start waking up. So, okay. So let's go to... The, sort of closing up here, looking at it a little differently. So the Zohar says, interestingly enough, because over the years, yes, now I hope you realize when it says, when people have told us Kabbalah will drive us crazy, great, that's the crazy I want to be. I want to be the intelligent, spiritual illogic, or as we now understand it, the true spiritual smart logic. I want to embrace my challenges. I want to give when I'm feeling a lack of, whether it's money, kindness, compassion, forgiveness, whatever it is. I want that kind of illogic because I will have the illogical blessing and protection versus the craziness that everybody else is going through. So who's really the crazy one? The one keep doing the same thing over and over again and hoping it'll be different, as we say, insanity? Or the ones who are doing the different things that looks crazy to the crazy people but is actually the spiritually smart, beneficial, and not only for me. Remember, if I'm shining light to get my blessings, I'm shining light on the world, so everybody else is also benefiting. So it's not I can be spiritually selfish for me, myself, and I. No. If I want all my blessings, the only way it happens is by shining my light, revealing the sleeping light in me, revealing the light that's been hiding behind my blindfolds. So more light in the world, everybody benefits, because like will attract like. So the light you send into the world will reach their heart and soul. Oh. Yes. Okay. So one of the most fundamental, I think, illogical things in the center, we call scanning. You look at this. This is called a book. It's the book of the Zohar, but it's a book. What does logic tell us about books? Well, number one, it has to be in the language I can read, right? Because if not, <coughs> what good is it, right? And then, you know, it's a book. So even if it's in a language I can read, I have to understand it to get benefit. If I can't understand it, what can I benefit? So the stupid logic says, oh, scanning the Zohar, scanning the Aramaic words, that's silly. But the spiritual intelligence says, no. Light radiates out of the words of the Zohar, the Aramaic, because those are the DNA of the Creator. Those are photons of the light of the Creator. So light emanates from them. So today, as 
now whatever it is, 30 years or so, when you go to the supermarket or you go to a store, how do they check out your groceries or your purchase? Barcode scanner. Well, where do you think that came from? First came the barcode of the Aramaic words and the eyes of window to the soul, our eyes. Then some scientists said, oh, if we can do it as a human being, let's do it as a machine too. So they took, in an allergy, the barcode, the Aramaic, and they made those black and white lines, and then they've got the computer that's programmed and the eye that sees. So we have the eye, the program of the creator is inside us already. The barcode is the Aramaic words of the Zohar, Zohar meaning illumination. So yes, it seems illogical, but whoosh, it wakes up the light of the creator inside of us. And as the light shines, you have greater clarity, inspiration, guidance, revelation. You start to realize you've always been the center of your universe, and you've always put yourself in those situations because you hold on to fear, anger, greed, jealousy, victimization, or what have you. So yeah, let's be spiritually intelligent. But, and this is what I realized, I shared it actually when I was in Israel, the Zohar says, because, you know, doing this 37 years, you've heard everything there is almost, almost. I'm sure there's still some new garbage out there. You're not allowed, and please, you know, let's take it in our frame. It says, you're not allowed to teach Kabbalah to the uncircumcised. Now, number one, okay, women don't get circumcised. So then we should be able to teach all women, right? No, but even that, if you go back to the, quote, lying tradition, no, you can't teach anybody who's not a man over 40, already very religious, scholarly, blah, 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 all that stuff. So women are fundamentally out, according to that. But if you're talking uncircumcised, no woman circumcised that I know, right? Men get circumcised. But that's not what it means. If you keep reading the Zohar, what it means is, and it talks about people with an uncircumcised heart. Because if you understand what it's teaching us in various sections of the Zohar, it says in essence, like most things, we have two hearts. We have the heart of the light of God. We have the heart of love and kindness and compassion. But in essence, there's also a heart of hatred, anger, jealousy, greed, all of that. So how can a person learn meaning really learn, not read the words and regurgitate the words, but learn in order to live this wisdom if their heart is still blocked with coldness, anger, jealousy, hurt, things like that. They have no vessel to hold the light of the Kabbalah, of the Zohar. So our job is to circumcise our heart, remove the hatred, the anger, the jealousy, whatever it is, then you have a vessel, you have a container for this wisdom, for the light of the Zohar. That's what it means you can't teach to the uncircumcised. Uncircumcise your heart. That's what our job is. So, and I'm just going to read this out because it came through very nicely. Only a circumcised heart that has removed hatred, anger, blaming others can be a vessel for the wisdom of Kabbalah and therefore to know and live only, only love for all humanity as the Creator loves all humanity. To shine God's infinite light to the heart and soul of all people. To perceive the reality that my neighbor is me and therefore to reunify humanity in oneness as we were in the beginning. We are able, we can, we're supposed to, it's available now. We can manifest world peace now by taking on this new mission to circumcise our hearts of hatred, victimization, and blame, and to reveal our God heart of love, unity, and oneness, so that everywhere we go and everyone we meet will feel the light shining into their heart from us, and that will draw out from them the light that will remove their darkness, and they will begin to also act like the light with us, and then only the light and love will guide us all into heaven on earth. God bless. Thank you. So now is the time. We know that uh, one, as I always make an effort, just to appreciate 
all your support. Many of you online, many of you here, give regularly, recurring donations to support us. The faster we spread the Zohar, whether it's this form, the big books as we call them, or the pocket Zohars, like this, either one. The faster we spread them, the light will shine in the world, we'll get rid of all the darkness. And that's our only mission. Get rid of the darkness, everything's clear. You know, I had a conversation with somebody recently, so I want to just make sure I'm appreciating all that you do give us. And I do truly kindly encourage you to push yourself and give more. Current events should be waking us up to realize only the light is going to stop the chaos. So I had a conversation with uh, somebody this weekend. You know, how are we going to fix this, that, and other? How are we going to stop the, you know, the fighting in America? How are we going to stop the fighting around the world? How are we going to... It's not our job. We don't know how. And I asked them the fundamental thing that I've learned for 37 years that I share with you often. When you walk into a dark room, how do you remove the darkness? How do you create illumination in that room? Do you tell the light bulb what to do? Do you tell the electricity of your house how to run through the wire to get to the light bulb and then tell the light bulb how to remove the darkness? Do you, yes or no? No, we're not smart enough to know. In fact, do you know, scientists to this day cannot tell us how light takes away darkness. We know it does. Everybody knows it does, but they cannot tell us scientifically how light takes away darkness. You know why? Because they can't define darkness. So if you can't define darkness, how are you going to tell us how light takes away darkness? Because as you and I understand, darkness is the illusion. We just said, if I put blindfolds on, I can't see. doesn't mean my eyes don't operate. doesn't mean that there's no light in the room. I've blindfolded myself. There's no such thing as darkness. There's our limited ability to perceive light. But there's no such thing as darkness. In fact, you're already thinking, what's the definition for darkness? The absence of light. No, I want to hear you tell me the definition of darkness without using light. Now define it, because I can tell you what light is without using the word light. Electromagnetic radiation of certain frequencies. Right? The red frequency, blue frequency, we understand that. But there's no definition for darkness, just an absence of light, which means blindfolds. But there's no definition, that's why. So is it our job to take away the darkness of the fights, whatever fight you pick? Even in your own life, you have an argument with somebody. It's not our job. Our job is just to turn on the light, like you do. Flip the switch, simple. You simply let the light take away the darkness. When you turn on the light of your soul, yes, we have to do the same thing. I know some of you going, yeah, I don't have to go to the wall, Chaim. I have whatever these things, and again, I don't want to use the words, but you know, I have those little things that sit and go, hey, Joe, turn on the light. Hey, where you follow, you have that, but you still have to do something. You still have to simply say, hey, whoever, Susie, turn on the light, right? That's it. But then Susie turns on the light, and the light knows how to take away the darkness. It's all the same. We are not capable to figure out how to stop the chaos. But we are empowered, meant to be, have the power and the mission just to turn on our light. Let it shine out there. And then let the light take away the darkness. So the faster we spread the Zohar, literally the book that shines light, the faster the darkness goes away. And then everybody, like in your room, if you're looking for something in the dark, you can't find it. You turn on the light, easy to guide yourself there. You still have to go pick it up. So the same thing, when we put enough Zohar in the world and there's enough light, we'll still have to go back and pay back our spiritual debt. But there'll be no more creating new debts because we already know exactly the right light behavior to do. That's it. So yes, those of you online, those of you here, please, just whatever extra you can give, whatever you can push yourself. Okay. And I know some people are going to criticize it or whatever, even if you just don't have one cup of coffee or one cup of tea, you know, like you take the five dollars and you give the five dollars instead of having the cup of coffee. Even that, think what you're gaining. If for five dollars you knew 
that giving it to the Zohar Project, one person out of 8 billion people on the planet, one person wasn't going to scream or yell or berate some other person on the planet. Is it worth $5 to you? Or beat somebody up or anything worse than that? Think about that. You spread the Zohar, you're stopping at least one person on earth from doing something really stupid like that. We have to start having a conscious awareness where our priorities are. And again, I'm not telling you, you know, again, in this frame, okay, we could sacrifice a cup of coffee or this, that, or other thing like that, but do. But again, it's an investment. It's not giving it away. You're investing. And this is why we take this time just to bless whatever it is that you want to give. For those of you online, I did put, I'll put it again, the link. So you do the meditation, then we have a meditation from one of the 72 names. And thank you for being patient. I see it's a little late. So just hold your offering in your hand. Open your heart. Circumcise the heart to really reach into the heart of God inside. The joy, the happiness, appreciation, the clear perception that we are just vessels. We are conduits of the light of the Creator. We are not the source of light. We are not the light itself. We are conduits to channel the light from the endless world through us into this world, to reach the heart and soul of every person on earth, to shine light into the world, to remove darkness. And so we have a greater sense of value, appreciation, gratitude for the talents, the abilities, the capabilities, and all that we have, grateful to the light of the Creator that is the source of it. Appreciating the work we've done, the effort to be better conduits. And in the consciousness that we are truly only one soul on earth. And having certainty that spreading the light of the books of the Zohar, this wisdom of Kabbalah, will activate the DNA of the Creator inside each person on earth that they will also, from within, be encouraged, motivated, almost impelled, compelled to behave with greater love, kindness, and compassion each day. And as it is investing in the projects of the Center, in the light of the Creator, through the Zohar, we know that it will come back to us and bless us in many ways, many, many times over. And together we say, Amen. So, for those of you here, yes, those of you online, if you're not familiar, you have 72 names of God, which again, go back to the Hebrew Aramaic letters as we've defined them, simply particles of the light of the Creator. This combination of Resh, Yud, Yud, awakens the energy to remove hatred, circumcising our heart, of the hatred, the blame, the lack, low self-esteem, guilt, shame, whatever you want to call that blockage. The power of this combination will penetrate directly into our heart and soul, draw light out from our heart and soul, as we will do in our meditation, but it's awakening a greater sense of the light within us. Okay. Resh Yud Yud. Just let yourself see the shapes. Let them become engraved in your mind's eye. And then if I can ask you, sit comfortably in your chair, feet flat on the floor, hands on your lap. Taking a few deep breaths, breathing in through the nose, hold the breath for a moment, exhale through the mouth. allowing yourself to circulate not only the physical breath, the physical air, but the light force that is in that breath of life. As it says, the Creator breathed into man the breath of life. 
we know meaning the light is injected in our soul that we could live the life of the light, bliss, peace in all ways, shape, or form. Allowing yourself to relax as you're circulating this energy physically and spiritually. Letting the light flow from head to toe with the breath so that you can relax open heart, soul, and mind. To focus on the infinite light as our true source and only source of lasting fulfillment. And now let's envision the energy forces, Resh, Yud, Yud. See them just above your head, radiating the pure light of the Creator. Feel the vibration that emanates from this combination, Resh, Yud, Yud. Think about, ask yourself, where are you still holding hurt, anger, victimization, blame, guilt, or shame? Hold that in your mind, and now let's bring the Reish Yud Yud through the top of your head that the energy to dispel hatred in all its forms is now entering into your being. And allow this force to travel from head to toe, activating the pure light of the Creator in you. Ask for clarity, guidance, how to transform those areas that you're blocked. Open your mind and your heart to receive the message. Now let's begin by letting a beam of light shine out of your heart to those situations that you've identified as being blocked. Just let the light shine. To those people in those situations, knowing that you're turning on the light, removing darkness, so that you can see that situation and those people in a new way. You can see your opportunity to reveal light, to actually help heal those people of their negative behavior as you're transcendent over the chaos that had existed there Bring yourself to yet higher level of your blessing, bringing the manifestation of a new version of you, the more light being. Let the Reish Yud Yud travel through this beam of light to their heart and soul. 
and then see it extending through them to all the rest of humanity. That the power of Resh Yud Yud reaches the heart, the soul, and the mind of every person. Awakening the power of the Creator in them. Activating the light in them that's been asleep. And see that light also radiating from head to toe in those people. That by circumcising the heart, removing the hatred, the anger, blame, victimization, any aspect of negativity, allowing each person on earth a new awareness of how powerful and blessed we are. And allowing the voice of the light, our soul, their soul, to be louder and clearer in their mind, in all of our minds. And as the thoughts of the light arise, each of us having new strength to follow the direction of that light, to follow the directions of our soul, to remove darkness and chaos through transformation, sharing in an orderly, light-filled way. And already feeling a new sense of greater peace, protection, love, health, abundance, a greater sense of unity, connectedness to the infinite light from above, channeling through us and connecting to the light in all humanity. Reish Yud Yud. Together, let's see the world immersed in an infinite sphere of light, and we envision all the world working together harmoniously, peacefully, with true love and care. And everybody with eternal bliss. Allow this sense, this vision, this vibration to settle in to your heart, soul, and mind. Strengthen your desire to keep it with you and to live it to a higher level each day. Together we take one more deep breath to anchor it, strengthen it inside of us, and slowly exhale as you're opening your eyes. Please remember in a few minutes, 
It'll be posted, uh, you know, it'll stay here on the Spiritual Sunday Facebook page. Just share it. Just throw it out to the universe. Share it wherever you have an opportunity, just on your Facebook page or anywhere else you can. Let's make a concerted effort to spread this wisdom to every person, that they will also hear and understand what we've just spoken about. And they'll have the ability to stop their stupid logic and to implement their spiritual intelligence. God bless. Have a great afternoon, great evening, and see you soon. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. If you liked what you saw, subscribe to this channel that you'll be notified when we post new videos. Share the video with your friends. They can also benefit. And check out the website, www.kabbalah.com, that's K-A-B-B-A-L-A-H, for hundreds of articles and classes. Wish you an amazing day, and God bless.